Hi, everybody. This gentleman probably needs no introduction, but for those very, very few of you not in the know, this is Wei Ko, who is the head of Revolution, head of Grail Watch, head of all sorts of wonderful horological things, as well as sartorial things. And uh, Wei, thanks for joining us today on the Armory TV. You know, anytime I have to, uh, the opportunity to be in the presence of my <laughs> sartorial <laughs> sufu, uh, I'm uh, delighted. And, and he really is a master. He is, uh, and he's helping me kind of uh, refine my style now that I'm a slightly more mature and older man and soon to be married as well. I wouldn't say life. mature, but older. Yeah, I'm still a clown. <laughs> <right? laughs> I'm definitely older and wider, unfortunately. Yeah, man, you and me both. Holy yeah. moly. Um, we have a very special watch in front of us. Like, I think if you are a watch collector and you don't know this watch or you've never seen this watch, you, you should, right? I, uh, you know, it's kind of like I, I'm in, in front of, you know, Indiana Jones when they, he finally finds like the Holy Grail, right? It's one of those moments, like there should be light shining like down mm -hmm. on us somehow and there should be like transcendent heavenly music playing mm -hmm. and the clouds parting and mm -hmm. we might even see the God waving at us because that this is in fact uh, an achievement of one of, well actually two of the horological gods. Mm -hmm. uh, it is in fact Derek Pratt's oval pocket watch and it is magnificent to behold. Yeah. Um, but we should also talk about Kari Butalainen's role in this watch, which we will uh, later on. But mm -hmm. what, do you, what are your first impressions, Mark? Well, it's very oval. <laughs> Indeed. It's very oval and pleasing in the palm because of its ovalness. Um, I mean, the finishing is wild. The variety of finishing used all over the place is wild. And just like the overall aesthetic, I mean, it's beautifully, beautifully, beautifully balanced. It's also larger than I expected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting because we've just exited what everyone's calling like the hype years, right? Mm -hmm. And you kind of wonder where are people are gonna be focused in the future, you mm -hmm. know? In incidentally, I think we're both very pleased that the hype years are over. Mm -hmm. What I think is going to be really interesting is a focus on true horological achievement, mm -hmm. right? And this is really fundamentally one of those. Mm -hmm. So of course we wanna talk about the aesthetics of the watch. Of course we wanna talk about the transcendent engine turning on the front. Yeah. But if you don't mind guys, maybe we can start from the movement side. Let's that, do that. Right? Mark, I totally I, agree. I don't wanna have a Butterfingers moment in front of camera and you're very uh, much more skilled, so I'm gonna ask you to, <laughs> to open it. I think you press the you're crown. You're giving me palpitations <laughs> because it's, you know, this is handling like a living legend. Indeed. It's kind of, well, not a living legend, but a legendary item right. in the world of neurology. That really is a transcendent moment. And I love the fact that it's actually stopped for a moment so that we can actually take a, a really close look at the the tourbillon with this incredible rouleau triangle, Ramon Toi de Galité. But let's talk a little bit about um, British watchmaking, right? Mm. To me, um, the British were the gods of the sea, basically, you know? Unfortunately, one of my countries was one of those that were colonized, but, but, but it's okay, no hard feelings, and we, we love, we love you, England, right? Mm -hmm. However, in order to cross the sea effectively, they had to have marine chronometers, mm -hmm. and it was John Harrison that was the first guy to create a marine chronometer. Mm -hmm. A marine chronometer is a watch that's so accurate it can be set to a reference point, probably England, right? And uh, judging uh, what local time is on the boat, you can basically figure out what your longitude is, which was the big deal back then. And you know, gave them a huge leg up in terms of colonization. It was essential for navigation, right. absolutely. So H4, which was the first successful marine chronometer, was a watch that used a chain and fusée, right, for stabilizing the torque that was coming out of the barrel. But it also used a seven and a half second remontoir de galité. So the remontoir de galité is a mechanism that removes the balance and escapement from the direct influence of the barrel. Mm -hmm. Why that's important, as you're, I'm sure you're aware, is because power reserve as it wanes, uh, the less torque is produced, and that creates less of a powerful impulse to the escapement and balance. Mm -hmm. So to me, British watchmaking is so intrinsically linked to the remontoir, right? Mm -hmm. But this watch is really impressive because it achieves one thing that even Abraham Louis Breguet was not able to achieve, which is to put the remontoir and the tourbillon together, you know? Back when I was a little kid, there was this like, uh, I think this commercial where someone inadvertently puts their chocolate bar in a, in a jar of peanut and it, it creates Reese's peanut butter cups. Hey, oh, hey you got your chocolate in my peanut you got butter. peanut butter in my chocolate. This is a combination that is even more um, uh, uh, delicious than that. And what is really cool here is that you have um, the, <clears throat> the remontoir wheel actually sits directly on top of the escape wheel. And then you have a rouleau triangle on top of that that has three arms that are connected to that wheel which rearms itself every five beats or every one second. So it's a beating at 18,000 vibrations power. And then there's a little anchor off to the side that interacts with it. And now we get to actually witness this. I mean, check that out, dude. It's awesome. Yeah. We'll have to have the Philips team wind it up so we can get a little footage of that. But God, it's just magnificent. Uh, uh, Did, was this ever used again? 
this principle of having the remontoir attached to the tourbillon? So it's interesting because now that we're looking at uh, wristwatch, the wristwatch era, I guess the first guy to, in serial production, mm. uh, use a remontoir with a tourbillon is our dear friend Francois Paul Jorn. Mm. But he has a remontoir wheel which is rearmed every one second that influences the wheel that is driving the pinion of the cage. Mm. But this is different because the the Remontoir is directly on the escape wheel. Mm. I mean, it's up to you to decide which one you like better, but to me, this is mind-blowingly cool. Mm. But I haven't really seen a wristwatch that has combined both of these, right? Mm. Apparently, from what I understand, uh, Lucas Soprano and Stuart Lessman, I believe, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, they've made a few um, commission pieces for clients, and I've never seen one in the wild. Mm. So if you have one of those, uh, and you see either of us, please come over and show it to us because I would love to see that. Mm. But that remontoir, just the remontoir, is being used in three watch brands. So the first is um, Der the Derek Pratt watch, which is being made by Lucas Soprano. The second is uh, Ferdinand Berthu, mm. the RV2, which has a chain infusé and that remontoir at six o'clock, both of which are not tourbillon watches. And then the last one is uh, Langenhain, which also has a similar rouleau triangle Remontoir de Galité. I, I guess they have their own design for that, but I should imagine they were inspired by Derek Pratt as, as all of those systems were. Absolutely. Now, this is probably one of the most beautiful movements I've ever set eyes on. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of cool because it's uncharacteristic of Derek Pratt. Mm -hmm. Derek Pratt watches, if you, or his pocket watches, if you look at them, usually they're twin barrel. Mm -hmm. And they have this kind of cool skeletonized frame um, that holds the barrels in place. And then you have you know, the gear train and then the tourbillon. Here you have just a single suspended barrel, right? Then you have this beautiful steel bridge holding the center wheel, right? And that steel bridge is really interesting to me because it seems like every independent watchmaker mm. eventually became inspired by that and yeah. started to integrate that steel bridge. Yeah. And Kari has one, um, uh, Reg Jap has one, yeah. um, Hervé Schluster has one, Simon Brett has one. Nayuta, one of the watchmakers at Master Pass Time, he also used the same thing. Exactly. I mean, you can tell why, it's super striking. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. And then if you look at the architecture of this tourbillon, you know, this is really, pre-industrial handmade tourbillon, right? Like yeah. at the highest level. It's it's a pillared a tourbillon, which are my favorite design. Elegant arms and steel, so beautiful. And then you look at the stunning finishing, which it looks like sun radiating out of the center of the, of the cage of the tourbillon. It is just magnificent to behold. So the reason why I mentioned that Kari Bluton Island, you know, is a big part of this as well, is that Derek Pratt was working on this. This was meant to be one of his master uh, oofs. Mm. And towards the end of his life, unfortunately, he was stricken with illness. He had mm -hmm. prostate cancer. And so then a lot of this watch was basically put together and finished by uh, Kari Butalainen. So mm -hmm. we should not um, fail to mention what an instrumental role that he had here. And if those of you who are Kari Butalainen fans and uh, understand what he's capable of achieving in terms of finishing, I mean, we see a lot of that here. You know, he doesn't speak about it much because he's a very humble dude. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, but you definitely see his his soul along with Derek's merged here. Yeah. Now the interesting thing for me is we're all of course one. <coughs> excuse me. Now the interesting thing for me is Mark is like we're wondering who's going to buy this thing on November eighth, right? I think there's a lot of potential people out there. Yeah. With Urban Jurgensen in the works. Yes. So I would well. say that's to me who most likely who will end up buying it. Uh, the Rosenfeld family who now own Urban Jurgensen along with Kari Butalainen. Mm. For them, this is a piece that they have to have. Mm -hmm. Why? It's because it's about Derek Pratt, who was the technical director of Urban Jurgensen for many years. Mm -hmm. And it's about Kari Butalainen, yeah. who is now the CEO of Urban Jurgensen. So guys, sorry to kind of create too much buzz around this watch. But you want to give him the product. But Thomas Parazzi is over there telling me, big it, big it up, guys. Big it. <laughs> no, seriously, it is uh, one of a kind, and it, it will be a foundation stone for any brand, mm -hmm. but in particular, Urban Jurgensen. So that's cool. So and there's a coherent way to, to continue their story. Exactly, dude. Mm -hmm. So, okay, now we're going to turn it back over. So I'm going to close that up. And then let's look at the front of the watch. And it's funny because I'm so old and my eyesight is so feeble. Like when I looked at it, I was like, oh, it's not engine turn. But in fact, after I looped it, I'm like, oh, actually it is. It's just that the engine turning is so extraordinarily fine. Mm -hmm. And the layout of the dial is magnificent. It was very funny because we had another guy here yesterday and we were all trying to figure out exactly what the complication was. Mm -hmm. So on the left, we have power reserve, but what's that on the right, Mark? It's a thermometer. I love that. <laughs> just not a common complication, I'd say. You know, but why not? Why not? Exactly. Why not? Exactly. Why not? Um, and the layout of the dial is so beautiful. I think it's interesting yeah. too because you know you see this, you see Derek Pratt, but yeah. also you see a little bit of Urban Jurgensen as well. Mm -hmm. right? So anyway, guys, uh, that is the Oval Pocket Watch. Um, come November eighth, happy bidding to everyone. 
uh, bid with your hearts and bid, bid big. <laughs> and I hope I can do the editing fast enough. If not, please admire the photos online. Um, it's a fabulous watch in Hong Kong. You really, really got to see it. Yeah, it's incredible, man. So. And then the auction is Geneva, November 8th. November 8th, yes, okay. exactly. Uh, Mark, you've got a couple of I do. I got rather extraordinary watches. I, I just wanted to show you because, you know, I love Japanese watches. And I think you, maybe you're not as close to this world as I am. Um, so Philips is holding this auction called the Tokyo Auction. That is November 22nd in Hong Kong. And it's a bunch of watches that are sourced from Japanese collectors, made by iconic Japanese brands, or are Japanese independents. They must fall into one of those three categories. I have two here that actually are my own that I'm letting go of. And um, I just want to do a little show and tell because it's cool. So first one here, this is Masa's pastime. Masa, his, name is, his, real, his full name is actually Masa Nakajima. Okay. Masa has this wonderful watch restoration, um, watch and pocket watch restoration workshop in Kichijoji in Tokyo. And you know, for the longest time he was restoring pocket watches, but then he slowly, slowly built up his team to make cases and dials and hands as well. And actually today he's expanded his team and developed his team to the point where they're making their own movements as well. Wow. So that, that, uh, that watch I mentioned earlier made by the gentleman named Nayuta, he actually is from Masa's Pastimes Workshop. And those guys as a little like watchmaking collective, they together as a team make that watch on behalf of that young watchmaker, which I think is just a super cool attitude. Anyway, this particular watch is something I commissioned a couple years ago because I always had this dream of owning a minute repeater. And you know, a good minute repeater, as you know, is a lot of money. But you can go a slightly more budget way, which is how I went, um, and convert a pocket watch. So this is a um, Egole Efi pocket watch from the 1890s uh, that has been converted uh, into wristwatch form. And I designed this case with Masa. So we actually went through a few different iterations of this case. Um, the pocket watch originally had a slide that was, I believe, at six o'clock, and then we just managed to rotate it. Um, we managed to keep the push button for adjusting the time. And you can say, actually, you know what? These are my watches. I don't need these gloves. <laughs> I want to take them off because it's Mark's watch as oh, well. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> we actually did the case in brass because we were prototyping. I always wanted to make this watch in white gold one day. Right. Mm, it's fabulous. And I picked this, this particular movement out of many, many movements simply because the sound was so good. It's unfortunately not a minute repeater. It's a five-minute repeater, but... Yeah, it's really deep. You know, right. it's, it's got a very uh, grand tone to it. And I think it's super clever because if this plus slide was at six, then the crown was at 12. So by turning it, it's perfect for a wristwatch. Yeah. It's really cool. It's interesting because we have to rig up the ins inside with a, little, with a little finger that just kind of pushes it when you touch the slide. Very cool. And then the dial is enamel as well. Stunning. And, and does he do the dials as well? Well, in this case, because the dial was no cracks, in perfect condition, he did not need to make a new dial. Wait, and hang on, so this is the dial from the... This is the original dial. Wow. Yeah. So he can make a new dial, but this actually is the original dial. That's Because incredible. it was in such great condition. And what year is that, that pocket watch from? 1890s. Dude, this is like so like vibrantly contemporary feeling. I know, right? And the hands are... Original as well. Dude. It's and cool, right? Like this could come out today, and you'd think of like, wow, it's a new, you know, new brand. Actually, you should I'm with you. create a brand for this because it's fantastic. Well, Masa's pastime is the brand, I guess. Yes. But yeah, so also whoever buys this, like if they're up for it, I would love to accompany them back to Masa's pastime's workshop to like develop the final case. Because my dream was to have this case made in white gold right. and then have it fully engraved. Like I had a plan for a chevron pattern that would just encircle oh, the entire bezel, cool. which I think would be really nice. I mean, talk to me about the inspiration for this case, Mark. I wanted something that captured like the pebble-like feeling of pocket watches. You know, right. when you hold a pocket watch, it's so satisfying. Yes. And I wanted that feeling to carry over, which is why both the front bezel and the case back both have that concave, uh, convex shape. Are the lugs soldered? The lugs are not soldered, it's one piece. It's nice because they have a very nice expression to them, mm -hmm. and even a little bevel here, which makes you think they might be another part. Mm -hmm. You know, they're long and attenuated and graceful. Mm. Um, fantastic work. Thanks, man. Yeah, and white gold would be amazing. It'll be sweet. I think it'd be really sweet. I would do like non rhodium plated white gold, so it's a little bit yellow. Nice. Yeah. Um, this other one is something that's very special, and I wanted to keep it, but I have something kind of similar, and so I decided to finally let go. 
So this is the 2011 reissue of the very first Grand Seiko. All right, so the Grand Seiko first came out in 1960. It was Seiko's attempt to beat the Swiss. In my opinion, they did a very good job. Like I think it's on par in terms of the aesthetics, in terms of reliability. Um, and to me, this is like one of the ultimate dress watches. 36 millimeters in platinum. Um, wow. When this was released in the 1960s, uh, the, the Grand Seiko first, they made them mostly in cap gold, mm -hmm. but they were very, very, very rare examples of it also being made in platinum. Those are impossible to find. I've come across a few in the hands of like collector friends, but they're really, really hard to find. And in 2011, when they reissued it in platinum, I thought, wow, this is really the ultimate expression of that original watch. Because now you have a reissue that upgrades everything, but keeps the original proportions, keeps the original details. That's phenomenal. Yeah, it's a comfortable, beautiful watch. Um, I was the first owner, because no one was buying these things at the time. So at the time, I was a Grand Seiko dealer. And there was another dealer who had this in his stock and he just like couldn't sell it. Right. And I was like, can I buy it, dealer to dealer? And they're like, yeah, yeah, sure. And actually that dealer was a cigar shop as well. So the watch arrived, it already <laughs> smelled of cigars. I was like, oh, this is great. I <laughs> don't need to make it any more cigar smelling. <laughs> you know, it was interesting with the, we were at a symposium uh, yesterday at, at Dubai Watch Week, Royal Watch Week Forums. Yeah. And, you know, we were talking about watches that are transmitted from one individual to the next and yep. so on. And it's, first of all, I love the fact that you're open about the fact that you sell watches, right? Yeah. Because everyone does. And, and to become a better collector, you kind of need to keep refining. 100%. Um, but it, I also like the stories that you were telling about watches that are passed around and, and actually you end up meeting the people that had it in the past. Yeah. Tell the guys here about that story about that bar, because that's a crazy story. Uh, yeah. So um, I met this gentleman, Mishima-san, at a bar in Tokyo that a friend of mine who I'd actually sold a watch to, and then we became friends. Um, he introduced me to this bar, I sit down, this guy's other side sits down, we're chatting a little bit. Turns out he's not just a watch collector, turns out he's a watch dealer. And we were talking, talking about watches we liked. And he was like, oh, you know, um, do you like Hajime Asaoka? I said, yeah, I love Hajime Asaoka. And he's like, um, I used to have the Tsunami number seven. And I was like, no way, because I had the Tsunami number seven, right? And so that watch had passed from Asaoka to Mishima to me with kind of some intermediaries, you know, without us even knowing it. So it was sort of like, it, would it be weird to say it's like meeting your ex-wife's boyfriend or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe even more pleasant than that. <laughs> the, the more pleasant version of that, yes, I think exactly. is what we're trying to say. Yes. We'll, we'll come up with a metaphor for that later. Although I guess your uh, ex-wife's new husband, and therefore you don't have to pay Alan money anymore, would be a, a person that you would love to meet. You'd be like, That's what's true. up? I love you. <laughs> Still hoping that'll happen. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's nice to know the world is small. It's nice to know that there's like nice collectors out there. And it's nice to have this sort of thing you can connect over. Indeed. You know? I guess that's one of the good things about having numbered watches, right? Because every once in a long while, you do actually come across the same watch twice. Absolutely. So, yeah. Well, Mark, it's been a pleasure, sir. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Thanks for doing this with us. Check out the auctions and uh, check out Way and Revolution and Grail Watch and all those great projects, all right? That's it for now. Cheers. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Sifu. Thanks, mate. <laughs>